by the time I got there, there were many trucks and buses barricading what's, what's virtually a four-lane highway. And across the buses, people had put out uh, posters saying, Hang Lee Pung, the premier. And they were yelling, uh, there were speeches uh, going on, people were listening to each other, talking, uh, they were trying to uh, rally up some support for armed resistance. One young man who was a student said, the people want arms, the people want weapons, they want to fight the military out of their city. They fought, however, very bravely. Setting military vehicles afire where they could. At the moment that China suppresses, and we talked about how the suppression was largely misrepresented in the Western media, but it certainly brought to an end these big protests that were taking place in Tiananmen Square, what Western media called the Tiananmen Square Massacre. But during that event, especially in the last couple of weeks, if anyone was watching American TV, and I certainly was, I was here, I know you were in China at the time. CNN in particular, but the other news networks, they were cheering on what they hoped would be a counter-revolution, meaning a toppling of the Chinese government, a toppling of the Chinese Communist Party. It was vivid that CNN seemed to be actually trying to foment a military uprising from different military divisions at that moment on June 3rd and 4th and 5th, 1989. And clearly, it showed that even though the U.S. had acted like it was a friend of China in the 1980s, all of the U.S. media, the U.S. government, and all of its allies from the other major capitalist or imperialist countries in Western Europe and in Japan, they all had the same position. They were all on the side of those who wanted to topple the Chinese government. And it reflected what the real nature of the relationship was still, in spite of the professed friendship between China and the West or China and the United States, when push came to shove, it wasn't very friendly. No, indeed. I think the attitude that was adopted, especially here in the United States, was that, you know, the United States was very happy that China had opened its doors and embarked upon this decade of reform and allowing direct foreign investment and things like that. The United States was certainly pleased with that as a set of developments. But the prospect of actually seeing the kind of regime change in Beijing that was, as you just mentioned, was unfolding in Eastern Europe and was about to see the final collapse of the Soviet Union, that would have created a much more favorable environment for integrating China into the global capitalist system. So the glee, the eagerness with which the Western media attempted to sort of fan the flames there in 1989 was premised on that sort of hopeful scenario that this might mean the end of even the facade, as they thought of it, of a socialist government and some sort of transformation that would allow Western capital to just operate at will within China might be in the offing. That, of course, is not what actually transpired. As you noted, the events of June 3rd, June 4th saw the suppression of those demonstrations and the reassertion of central government control within the capital. That itself triggered a very strong reaction on the part of the Western powers, on the part of the United States in particular, in that there was just a massive condemnation of China, boycotts against Chinese activities, Chinese businesses. There was talk in political circles of trying to expel China from certain international organizations. There was a very hostile reaction to the suppression of those demonstrations. And it really hurt for the rest of 1989 into 1990, 91. It isolated China and it was a very severe challenge to the ongoing reform program. And I think that that experience, of course, shaped the perspective of the Chinese leadership. There were some changes in that leadership in the wake of all that, but it certainly sent a message to China that the hand of friendship, which had supposedly been extended in the 1980s, was also capable of a pretty firm crackdown, a pretty firm opposition to China and especially to the continuing leadership of the government and the Communist Party. It reveals in a particular kind of way what the actual political and class character is 
of the People's Republic of China. Yes, China had adopted some capitalist style economic reforms. Yes, it had privatized some industry. Yes, it had dissolved the peasant communes. Yes, it was inviting Western capitalist corporations to come in and to set up shop to, you know, essentially exploit Chinese labor and all of those kind of things. But when push came to shove, when it looked like there might be a civil war, the United States was for the civil war and for the civil war and supporting the people who wanted to topple the government. And when you think about a similar type scenario playing out, say, in the capital city of England, say if it was in London or if it was in Paris, if it was in the capital of Germany, if it was in Rome, if it was in Tokyo, if there was a huge, massive movement that stopped the government from functioning, that you know was taking arms from the police and the military, that was organizing essentially an insurrection, and its goal was to topple the government, under no circumstance would the United States support such a rebellion in London, in Paris, in Rome, in Tokyo, in Germany. And yet when it happened in China, it wasn't like there was a little bit of support for the counter-revolution. There was uniform across the board support. And it makes me believe, and this is my position, it reveals the class nature of what's going on in China because the American capitalist establishment, like the one in Germany, France, Japan, Italy, highly class conscious, highly class conscious, and they do not support, quote, color type revolutions against their allies. Clearly, China's in a different camp. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think that what we saw in 1989 and what we have seen in other instances, and I think what's animating American policy towards China today is that the Western powers, the United States perhaps most of all, have maintained a sort of attitude of wishful thinking towards China, that they believed that economic reform, that you know the utilization of market mechanisms for the process of economic development would inevitably lead to the kind of political liberalization in the sense of a restructuring of the Chinese state in a way that would introduce mechanisms, multi-party elections perhaps, things like that, which would be much more amenable to the manipulations of capital as of course they are in our own country. And the United States elites have repeatedly convinced themselves that China was going to follow the path which they think is what happened with the Soviet Union or the governments in Eastern Europe of reaching this kind of terminal systemic crisis. And then that would sort of inevitably give rise to a political situation which would be much more favorable, much more open to the penetration and the dominance of Western capital. But as you say, the class nature of the situation in China was very clearly demonstrated. And so that sort of frustrated and enraged the Western powers and led to this period of a couple of years of real diplomatic isolation for China. Now, of course, that didn't mean in practice that American corporations shut down their operations in China or that they ceased to pursue opportunities for investment in China because capital, of course, always goes where it can find the greatest returns on its investment. So the economic relationship persisted but the political relationship was severely disrupted and that was a challenge that the Chinese had to face. So after Tiananmen, after a couple of years of isolation, or at least a semi-isolation, it's clear that the Chinese government is not going to be overthrown, that the Tiananmen Square uprising you know, had been suppressed and that China had managed to sort of get through the crisis. It did not happen to China what happened to the Soviet Union or what happened to the countries of Eastern and Central Europe, the so-called socialist governments. I say so-called because... They had the perspective of socialism, but they were still in a very, very early stage of socialism and had, you know, in the case of Poland, partly socialist and partly capitalist, at least in the countryside. But it was clear that China wasn't going the way of the West. And so the dominant element of the dichotomy in Western 
orientation towards China. One, looking at China as a place where great profits can be made, where a great huge market became available to sell things, and a great huge labor market where you could produce things at low cost and then ship them overseas. In other words, exported from China, but really where China was basically a last step assembly spot. That sort of perspective on China, how to make maximum and super profits, that really kind of won out over the, like, we must carry out the complete isolation of China, destroy China, and have a counter-revolution in China. Since it didn't look feasible, it didn't seem like a viable political alternative. The U.S. basically went back to business after a little while with China. Yeah. And China's goal then is to try to sort of soft sell any oppositional position to the United States, thinking "Mm, the U.S. may in fact still allow us to integrate into the world economy to continue to do this. China's priorities in its foreign policies really correspond completely to its own internal economic objectives. Exactly. I think that one of the critical turning points after 1989 was what's called the Southern Journey, the Nanshun in Chinese, that Deng Xiaoping makes in 1992. And it's both a turning point or a reaffirmation within China of the commitment to the reform program. But it's also a signal, it's also a message to the global community. Deng Xiaoping goes south, visits Shenzhen and some of the other special economic zones, and really, you know, reaffirms his commitment and the commitment of the party and the commitment of the government to the ongoing pursuit of the policies of reform and opening. And I think that just as you just indicated, that the message that that sends to the global capitalist community is that despite the hostility, despite the antagonism that had been manifested over the previous couple of years by outside governments, that China was more or less open for business, was prepared to continue this kind of relationship in which foreign enterprises could come into China, they could pursue their profitable operations, they could repatriate at least a portion of the profits they were generating, and that China was going to carry that on. And the underlying message of that is just, as you were just suggesting, is this very pragmatic approach of saying, look, These are the policies which we believe we need to develop our economy. We believe we need to improve the livelihood of our people, to enhance the material circumstances of people's lives. And so we're ready to keep going on that path. And the international community, you know, the capitalist world, if you will, of course, they were eager to avail themselves of the reservoir of highly qualified but lowly compensated labor that was available in China. And they were very happy to sort of reinvigorate or revive that economic relationship. And by that point, by 1992, I think, of course, there's political changes taking place in the United States. We have the Clinton administration about to take office, the era of sort of neoliberal dominance under Reagan and the first Bush is not coming to an end, certainly. It had reshaped America's political economic perspective. But this was a good moment. The Clinton administration could take a somewhat gentler approach towards China. So I think that ushers in this period through the 90s and into the first decade of the present century of a, you know, non-ideological approach, a pragmatic approach of saying, well, China may not be reforming its political system as quickly as we would like, but we have faith that in the long run, if we just stay engaged and we just keep encouraging reform, 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 that that will lead to a sort of political convergence. So even though that had clearly been not what happened in 1989, the attractions of economic integration with China were sufficiently powerful to redirect American policy, American foreign policy to this era, a second era sort of of engagement with China over the following couple of decades. I want to draw an analogy, a comparable strategy that was employed by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union by the Bolsheviks under the leadership of Lenin, and that was in the year 1921. The Soviet Union had just emerged from three years of civil war, 
14 imperialist armies had invaded the country. The German government, before it finally you know, lost World War I, invaded Russia after the sort of procrastination on the signing of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, such that about a quarter of Russia was taken by Germany. And in spite of all of these imperialist threats and machinations and desire to overthrow the Bolsheviks, Lenin turns in 1921 and introduces something called the New Economic Policy, where he invites the same imperialists who just invaded the country to come and set up shop in the new socialist Russia, the new socialist Soviet Union, and says to them, look, we're willing to give you lots of concessions. You can make lots of money. You can employ Russian workers and other nationalities who are within the new Russian Socialist Federation. You can make lots and lots of money. And in exchange, we will have some more economic activity and economic development to overcome the tremendous devastation that the country was experiencing as a consequence of earlier underdevelopment economically because of World War I, the loss of 3 million people, another 3 million killed during the Civil War in the imperialist invasion of Russia following the Russian Revolution. We invite you to come in and we will grow. And Lenin called this the new economic policy. And he also described it to the comrades. He said, look, we're letting the wolf in the door. These people are hostile to us. All they want to do is overthrow us, but they also want to make profit. So we're going to let them make profit and we're going to use them the way they're using us and we need to do it. But let's face it, when you let the imperialist capitalist wolf in the door, he becomes more dangerous. So we are going to engage in an economic retreat, a retreat towards capitalism, but it's so that we can hold on to power and develop the country. Now, the Chinese in 1991, 92 They've just gone through a terrible attack after Tiananmen Square, isolation from the Western imperialist countries. They're doing the same thing. Deng Xiaoping's southern tour is basically sending the same message that Lenin sent. The differences, though, are important. One is when Lenin invited the imperialists to come into Russia, almost none of them did because they decided, even though they could make super profits, it was going to help the Bolsheviks too much. And secondly, Lenin said this is a retreat away from socialism, but a necessary retreat so that we can survive because of the emergency exigencies and poverty that's been imposed upon us. Now, the Chinese, their offer to the Western capitalists was embraced. Western capitalists did invest. And the Chinese didn't say this is a retreat away from socialism. They said this is something different. They said this is socialism but with Chinese characteristics. In other words, not a retreat imposed on the party by economic exigency and emergency, but really the path forward. Anyway, what do you think about the analogy? Oh, I think the analogy with the NEP works very well. And the key to it is the political nature, as you say, the class nature of the state which is acting as the host. The Soviet Union in the early 20s was obviously in very dire circumstances economically. And Lenin saw that by embarking on the new economic policies, this was a possible way of sort of jumpstarting the economy that could then be directed into the path of socialist transformation. And I think the parallel with that is that the Chinese, and they've been very clear about this from the beginning of the reform era, their objective is to utilize market mechanisms as a way of developing the economy. You go back and you read the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels are very clear that the development of the bourgeois economy driven by the marketization of the European economies was a tremendously creative period. And that, you know, there's this sort of rising era where marketization drives innovation and creativity within the economy. And that's what the Chinese are hoping to achieve. And obviously, they have had great success with that program over the last 40 years. But the key is that it's not the operation of markets in an unrestricted, unregulated environment. It's not just, you know, handing the keys over to the bourgeoisie and saying, here, take it for a spin. It's inviting capital to come into the Chinese economic space, engage in activities there in partnership with the Chinese side that are going to yield beneficial results in terms of economic development, in terms of the acquisition of modern productive technology 
technologies in terms of management, organizational things like that. Uh, but under the leadership and the guidance of the Communist Party and the government of the People's Republic. So it's not just throwing the gates open. It's a managed process that is going to bring China to the level of material prosperity necessary to reach a sort of threshold stage where you can really talk about beginning to develop socialist relationships, where you can really talk about distribution based on a more equitable basis. So I think that the parallel with the new economic policies in the Soviet Union is very good in terms of what the intent was. Obviously, the way that that worked out for the Soviets was not that great. And then, you know, other developments took place later in the 1920s that set the sort of socialism in one country agenda for a long time. But China has done an excellent job of retaining the leadership of the party and having the party play that kind of role of oversight. Certainly, the use of markets has yielded tremendous contradictions within China, but so long as there's a strong and clear leadership guiding that process, I think that it's been a remarkably successful endeavor. It has, of course, further encouraged these ideas, these anticipations in the West, that economic change would inevitably lead to political transformation. And that has not happened. And the Chinese have also been very clear that that's not going to happen. That's not what they want. They're aware that that's a danger and they're doing what they have to do to guard against the emergence, the consolidation of a bourgeois class, of a bourgeois political force within the country. That has governed China's foreign policy orientation ever since the early 90s. That idea of a practical engagement, China's entry into the World Trade Organization as a sort of case example of China's orientation towards the global system.